It's really nice to be invited today, and not least because um, I studied at uh, Brighton University, craft, three-dimensional craft and design, and um, one of the tutors here was a man called, um, and the course leader was Chris Rose, and this is 20 years ago, and on our first ever um, design lesson, um, he got us in and he put a plastic disposable bottle on the table and said... Um, for us, this is an everyday object that is used and disposed of and on and on and on. But imagine taking this to another culture. Imagine, imagine taking this to a tribe somewhere. What an unbelievably useful container. It's clear, so you can see the quality of the um, water. It could last years and years um, and has a, um, a cap that will keep contaminants out. And that sort of started me thinking. And obviously, that's a very, very current subject, but um, shows how many brilliant people have been thinking brilliant things for a long time. Um, I then went on to quit uh, Brighton University because I got really interested in permaculture um, at the time, and actually several, a few faces from this time around, um, we had a charitable trust called the Natty Trust, and we were interested in securing land um, for the public and um, using permaculture principles in all sorts of different ways. And I got particularly interested at that time in permaculture for people. Um, and then uh, with that trust, we were trying to um, set up um, communities. We'd take a piece of land and we'd uh, run a design um, through... Uh, we'd hold a gathering of about 500 people, run permaculture courses, and um, then uh, make a design for the, for the site. And that might be saying, actually, we should just leave this entirely alone, or this could support four families, or this could be some sort of wonderful um, garden. Um, that then led me on to um, realise that you could get sort of 500 people, like-minded people with a shared vision, and you could all end up arguing. Um, <laughs> so with a nice tie-in to what's Lex and Keith, what, what came up there, I like the... Um, note of emotional um, emotion, emotional flow, that actually led me on to go and study uh, spiritual psychology. because so I thought, oh, we really need to learn how people can work together. Um, anyway, I sort of started off making things and obviously studying craft. Here are just a few examples of our projects. I founded Studio Hardy. It was called something else before, but about 10 years ago. We became Studio Hardy three years ago. And um, one of the permaculture principles is um, uh, stability in diversity, or diversity is, is strength. Um, a sort of really key part of Studio Hardy is um, diversity. We try really different things. Um, we constantly try to experiment. We work with different materials. We work with different industries. And right at the heart of um, Studio Hardy is this idea of... Um, boundaries not really existing. So in the building world, in the architectural world, often you have an architect, a structural engineer, um, you might have a developer, you might have a council involved, you have um, a user, a, a, a homeowner. And um, we, we just wanted to create an environment where there was no hierarchy and all of those people talked and learned from one another. So in our studio, um, and workshop. There's no, there is a door between the studio and the workshop because of dust, but essentially people that are making can come into the studio and design. And people that are designing um, have material knowledge and can go out. And we make all sorts of wacky and wonderful things. I mean, essentially in architecture, engineering, craft, art. Um, and one thing that we've got particularly interested in and actually, I think I can hone this right down to that Natty Trust Brighton University moment is uh, I was sitting around somewhere and someone uh, had a copy of Shelter by Lloyd Kahn um, that just, it just sort of brought everything that I'd ever thought together and perhaps the, the spiritual aspects, the ecology and um, the hunger to make the handmade. Um, we make all sorts of things, <laughs> some very wacky challenges. And, and a loose theme is small spaces. I mean, it's partly because actually 
you know, if you work in these very, we do work on very, very big developments occasionally, but they're so long winded and we get a little bit bored. So the advantage with small things is you can sort of get, get involved, turn them over, come up with lots of ideas, make them and then move on to the next project. Um, I got very interested in timber framing and worked with lots of brilliant timber frame carpenters. Um, and I think that taught me cerebral things. We're doing a lot of restoration. So we're working on five, maybe up to 800 year old buildings. And these are still functional today. They're beautiful. They're uh, made from renewable, renewable um, materials. And just the longevity is incredible. Um, so that kind of set the tone that we didn't, though we, we go on to work in some very fickle, weird industries such as TV and exhibition build, um, that sense of longevity became very important. We should be making things that would last a very long time and they will need maintenance, they will need adapting, but um, that became important. The other important thing was the sort of kit build, the idea that you could make, you could assemble something and deassemble it. We work a lot with collaborations with architects. Sometimes architects come to us and say, we've got this idea, got an envelope sketch, but we don't quite know how to, to realise it. Um, this is a, a flower stall that pivots, a whole half of it pivots open and closed. It's made in a coir and it's derived from looking at um, flower petals under a microscope. So also this sort of folding of um, um, craft technology, modern materials, modern processes um, and process. Process is really important to us. You see lots of photos well, some photos of the making, because that's as interesting as, as the final object. So this is one of my first projects, um, and I was quite young, and I got a commission to build a, a, a playground in the Middle East. And I looked at, um, got very excited about doing um, baked in the sun mud bricks, but the client really wanted to move away from what was around them, uh, didn't wanted to move past the vernacular, which is we, we argued hard for. Um, but then we thought about, well, how, how can we, you know, build something special and organic and something different to what they have? They don't have many trees, but also that we can um, efficiently ship out there um, in components. So we went back to timber framing and derived this, um, I suppose this project really taught us the, the process. So um, I this mixture of an artistic process, sort of sculptural process, a manufacturing process, thinking about what do we know about, what materials would be appropriate, um, but also a kind of scientific uh, formula. You know, so I remember being at school and you had a sort of aim apparatus. Um, and I think all our work is this constant juggling between art and science. Um, inspiration comes, but we work very, very hard to get there and we trial lots of things. Another interesting thing about this, um, we sort of developed, this is a modular cruck system that we could um, build a playground with, and you'll, you'll see this in other projects. Um, the other thing that really interests us is these, in order to be stable in this climate, which is a real experiment, um, we had to absolutely diligently follow the grain of the trees, which meant we could design this thing, um, either on paper or on computers, but then the exact shapes would utterly depend on, um, on the individual tree. So we ended up sort of creating node points that we said, you know, it, these two, two crut blades have to meet here and here and things need to join here and here. But between that, we'll just let, let it do whatever it does. That's a swing boat, our version of a sort of Victorian fairground. Absolute tragedy. We actually worked with a, a shipwright on that and then very, very shyly at the end said, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to drill some holes in the bottom, which is a terrible thing to ask a shipwright to do. And we work on very diverse projects. So this is a, um, a Nissan um, all-electric van. Um, and Nissan approached us to have a think about what we could do with this van. Um, it, it was mainly going to be used for sort of building market, but they said, you know, what if it could be a mobile office and you could actually go and work from anywhere? So playing with... Um, Inside outside is another theme. We're really interested, and I think because we, we love nature, we love our surroundings, we're, we're every, you'll see this, every single project is essentially 
especially in this country, about any second you can be outside, you want to be outside. And also maximising your space. So um, if you've got a small space, um, the more nature you can bring in and the more you can jump out into the landscape, you can double, triple your space. And it's surprising how often you can um, get outside. Another real theme that you'll see is uh, multifunctional furniture. We just love, I mean, I think it's something in the kid in us. We just love the sort of playfulness of things. And um, that's a lot of trial and error, you know, in products that really work. It has to be, you see those IKEA testing machines that sort of pump something a billion times. Um, there is a lot of error <laughs> in this, but eventually you get things to work. Um, this is just a quick process of a, a, another similar um, project. This was in Kuwait, and this was a real fusing of, um, it was a tower, a folly essentially, but for the family. And um, it's a real fusing of uh, timber framing, um, uh, traditional joinery, shipwright, ship, um, boat building. And this just shows a little bit of how we work, hundreds and hundreds of ideas, exploring. And I think that's something that, that how we come to processes, it's, uh, uh, to solutions is almost, almost exploring absolutely every avenue to make sure we've got the right route. Finding the shapes we needed, going, going uh, into the forest or going to sawmills and finding the particular shapes, cutting them out. I mean, that's the main crux blade. So we have this quite, you know, we built all this on a computer, but then within it, it had organic elements. And we lo I really love that sort of playfulness between modern technology and tradition. This is the frame out in the, uh, it was so hot out there, 52 degrees. Um, so we worked very, very early in the morning. You could drink eight litres of water a day and you go for a pee once. Quite, quite amazing. Um, and this weird, you know, we got very interested. We looked at um, shells and sort of slightly Fibonacci and spirals. Um, and this really tested our craft limits, particularly putting it out in that degree of heat. Um, so again, you could, I think, you know, sculpture, art, engineering, traditional craft, some modern materials. See lots of borrowing from boat building. So a completely different project. We, something that we do, I think because of our process, our design process, which I, I want to, I think I can liken to some of the principles of permaculture, um, the observe and interact, and um, the design from patterns to details, and um, I particularly like the, the ed use of edges and the marginal, the in-between spaces, the overlap. And I think that, that's something we're very excited about. This is the design museum for Phil, uh, John Pawson, sort of grandfather of minim modern mid minimalism. Um, he wanted a one-to-one one scale room. Mm. And one, one thing we noticed about the design museum, um, we did several projects. They, they're very ambitious. They do wonderful builds. But at the end of those builds, there would be five colossal skips. And the whole, lot, all of that effort, all of that energy, all of that MDF was just going into skips. And then the new one was coming in. And so we devised, we, we re-looked at the whole system. And we devised a system whereby they could just reuse all the materials. So there were no, what they used to do is you, you um, pepper it with screws and, um, and then plaster over the top and no one could find the screws. And it was just inefficient to take everything out. We just managed to devise a system where we built it back to front. It was kind of based on um, looking at steel structures and how they worked. Um, and the lovely thing is we'd done Hussein Chalian uh, at, um, at the Design Museum, and then maybe four years later did this, and we were finding the same material was still in use, which was um, really interesting. And I think came from just applying different knowledge, different ideas. This is the Kilda... Um, Tree, tree house called a sky den. Um, a real challenge, it's sort of most of it is accessible. Um, it's at Calvert Trust, which is accessible char charity. And again, we, we were interested in um, creating and capturing views. There's a relationship. This is actually on a riverbed, which is quite fast flowing in the winter. So sort of huge engineering feat. Um, reusing, we found a we were looking for a circle and how to make one, and we actually found that you could um, find used culverts for massive um, motorway drainage. So reuse that. Um, and because it has a dark sky policy, um, we did a project where 
again, a small space letting nature in, we opened up the roof so that you could lie in bed and um, see the stars. But yeah, ma massive feat of engineering. Then inside, we're very interested in playfulness and small space. One thing, flexibility. Can you, um, can you put everything away? When you're in a really tiny space, that's really quite useful. So this is our sort of log cabin mock Georgian dresser. So everything folds away and, and also playfulness. That's a real theme in our work. So um, that table actually, I think there's a tiny console. You pull that out and the whole top folds down from the wall. So we love things that open in a sort of unexpected way. Another product we developed for this, which is um, sort of a flat pack stool that can all just um, sit away. A very challenging project in our first TV project, we were given a very tired, you know, actually something that was designed for its 20, 30 year lifespan. It utterly reached the end and we tried to give it a new lease of life and try to reinvent it. Um, those, those are recycled um, caravan and ship windows. Again, about bringing the inside out, the, the, the whole side. So it still looks like a crappy 1970s static home, a caravan, um, but the, the side folds down and then the doors open out and as much as possible you can live outside, um, repurposing and tarting up a lot of um, things we could find. Um, again, everything's multifunction. This is all verging on the daft, but there's a wardrobe, a flat a wardrobe that pops up in that seat. The middle seat pulls out to give you a massive double bed, and then the third seat has a bath in it. <laughs> okay, this um, Andrea talking about um, how much space if we all shared is really interesting. Um, so this is a, a, a madcap project but actually an interesting exercise. A lot of our work, I think, is about experimenting and asking questions, being quite playful, but hopefully it's useful, useful to others. Um, that was from the great exhibition, I think. Um, I'm going to whip through this because I'm getting behind. That is the most brilliant, most exciting thing I've ever seen in my life, which was in this by Dries Krijkamp in the Netherlands, who was obsessed with spherical living and how it's the, the minimal surface area. We're, a lot of houses in England have corner cupboards and they're completely useless. Someone had some corner shelves and they realised that if you fold a sheet into a triangle, it will fit. And that, never mind all this clever design and multifunctional playfulness, that's what it's all about. If you, if you, can, you, know, if you can change the way you live, then small spaces really start to work. This is experimenting. We, so, sorry, I didn't explain what this is. It's a rotating home. So, uh, nine square meters that will rotate. So, it becomes a wall and your floor will rotate. So, you've got four rooms on each wall, no corridors, no doors, one single living space for two people. You have to get on, you have to work out. You, if you want a cup of, if you want to cook a fry up in the middle of the night, you've got to do some serious negotiations. <laughs> And it's just a little bit of our thinking process. That is all some of the configurations. That's in different modes, trying to work this thing out. I love that photo. That is one of our carpenters just, just going, I can't think anymore. We do a lot of that. And that's the finished. It's a very much a prototype. It is fun. It's playful. But it started thinking about volume. If we, if we really don't have so much space, and we have to share it. You know, rooms are really interesting. There's huge pockets of space that are never used. So that's walking into the hallway. Um, that's the kitchen. Underneath the kitchen table is the bed, so it's in full rotation. You actually climb, a ladder comes down and you climb up. In the back is the bathroom and those buttons you can see. You press a button and you can move on to the, um, to the next room. And all the kitchen shelves are on gimbals. Um, you notice the tap has to slide back because the whole, the whole building rotates. Um, pretty mad. That's it in bedroom mode with your bed up top. Um, all sorts of um, small spaces for different applications. I'm, I'm running low on time, so I'm just going to whip through these. But again, multifunctional. This is you know playing with um, every single... Uh, in that... Um, Sofa is a table tennis table. Uh, there's also a bar. Um, in the wall, you might recognise Brighton Pier. There was no view, so we had to create a view. We picked Brighton Pier. Um, our four desks for a family to, to work at. They're hidden behind the images. That's the inside of that beach hut, which was recycled from an old beach hut. You can see lots of bits. 
Um, we, still, we did our own experiment of a mo this is a modular system where you can build the interior of buildings and these are modular panels that can be f configured in lots of different ways so people can design a space very much feel like it's their own space but sort of tweak it to their own needs it's kind of like a, a mini Ikea version of a house and the same with the, the exterior of this building it's called Amazing Sheds um, and that's sort of more funky colourful version uh, this is an artist studio um, that doubles up as a, a guest room, but a family that um, loves to do clay, make um, uh, ceramics, um, Lego, carpentry. So it's a sort of fully fledged workshop. Uh, it has workbenches down the other end and so on. And then it can all kind of just um, slip away and be a lovely sort of family guest room space. This is a writer studio in Lewis that we've just done off grid and very much built out of, um, made up as we went along, which is always interesting because we have to submit for planning, but then give ourselves as much room for playfulness. Lots and lots of found windows and bits and bobs. Oh, it's really, and then a, you know, every writer needs a little nap. Um, other works. Playfulness is very important to us. Um, that's a pimped up table tennis, upcycled table tennis table. We thought, you know, every sport has etiquette and grandeur and an outfit, and table tennis just didn't seem to have that. So we sort of did a leatherette top with, embossed in gold, and there's a huge cannon turned legs, um, but it still folds up. <laughs> and another sort of fun project. Um, I'm going to round off now, but um, the bit I haven't really mentioned is actually team, and that's ultimately, out of all the things we've explored, and... What I think, at the end of the day, we've done all sorts of experiments and, and hopefully um, they're interesting and, and helpful to other people, but really I think it's how we work that, that has changed. The non-hierarchical, the, the fact that we all communicate, there are no um, boundaries between disciplines or, or one another. Um, and ultimately, we, we just really respect and get along with each other, so it becomes a really lovely place to work, even though we are deliberately taking on the most headache, headachey projects you can imagine. So, uh, celebrating the team. <laughs>